It's December, and Bonn is a very cold, wet place to be this time of the year. And I bet some of you rather be in a warm place and sit in the sun right now. So let me take you there. Imagine a landscape, maybe a landscape that you're from, tropical ideally, it's a little warmer there. Maybe a landscape that you visited. Imagine seeing it from the vantage point of an airplane window seat or from top of a mountain. Imagine all the elements in that landscape, the forests, the grasslands, the people, the livestock. Think about the food that you ate there produced in that landscape or the commodities produced in that landscape and exported out into the world. And think about how that landscape that you know has been changing and is changing over time. And keep that picture in mind. We will need it in a moment. This is my landscape in southern Germany, Swiss Alps in the background. That's where I was born, this is where I grew up, and I even derived a livelihood from that landscape that paid for my education. But I'll tell you about that some other time. And you probably see many of the same elements that you just pictured. And this landscape, just their landscape that you have in your mind, has been changing for a long time, and it continues to change but perhaps more in subtle ways these days. For instance, since I moved away there, many people have given up farming, and farmers now have solar panels on the top of their barns. Now, what I'd like to talk about is something you don't readily see in the landscapes when you look at them and admire their beauty. And that is the carbon stored in that landscape, and the carbon that is taken out of the atmosphere as vegetation as forests grow, but also the carbon that goes into the atmosphere as we perhaps manage soils in an unsustainable manner. You all know that global greenhouse gas emissions are high, and we cannot continue on the path we're on. Otherwise, we'll be cooking the planet, and by the end of the century, we'll be in a place we rather not want to be. And we have to start bending the curve on global greenhouse gas emissions, and basically, over the next century, bring them down to zero. The global economy has to run on net zero carbon. Imagine that. And that's basically what uh, countries agreed two years ago in Paris. The two-degree trajectory that we want to get on. And we cannot get there without my landscape, your landscape, in fact, all landscapes taken together. They have to become one giant carbon sink for the planet, a sponge that sucks up the carbon out of the atmosphere and puts it into the roots and the trunks of the vegetation in those, um, in those landscapes. So we need these landscapes. Otherwise, the target defined two, uh, two years ago in Paris becomes unachievable. Now, this is some information I worked on for a very long time. It took me a long time to prepare this slide. I know you're confused now. He's German. He cannot be funny, but you know, just, go, just go with it. <laughs> This accomplishes two things. If you can't read this, go see an eye doctor. But it also tells you that a lot of countries that signed up to Paris put land use as part of their plans to help achieve this global challenge and bring down global emissions with land use. Many of these countries have very ambitious plans as part of their commitment to the Paris goals that essentially require a fundamental transformation of how they use land and landscapes in their country. Now, for that purpose, we have created and we operate a number of initiatives, partnerships at the World Bank. Partnerships where the private sector, indigenous people's groups, civil society organizations, practitioners, academics, and uh, scientists work together to, and we put our heads together how we can help countries make these transformative changes that they have set out to accomplish. And let me just highlight one of our major initiatives, one of our two major partnerships, which is the Biocarbon Fund's Initiative for Sustainable Forest Landscapes. I'll just call it initiative, otherwise I'll be twisting my tongue every time I say it. And I mention this because this initiative recently published an approach that helps countries measure and monitor carbon across vast landscapes in a manner that helps them achieve these objectives. Before I explain details, or give you a snapshot of that approach, just a couple of visual impressions of what these great ideas are that countries are putting forward 
and proposing to our partnerships for financing. And these are practically the same things that you hear about at this Global Landscapes Forum. Growing coffee more sustainably, restoring degraded peatlands in Indonesia, or developing a relatively untouched forested landscape in Colombia in a way that boosts livestock production and agroforestry in a way that keeps the carbon in that landscape. Now, here's where I need your landscape again, the one you imagined earlier. Maybe it looked like this one, a patchwork of different land uses that constantly change and alter the carbon flux across that area. And I should mention, the landscapes that we're working on are vast landscapes. Many of the programs that we have in our portfolio include 20, 30 percent of the land area of that country. That gives you a sense of the ambition. Now, we want to take my landscape, your landscape, and I'd like to present to you our innovation, the cheese dome. Yes, the cheese dome. That's where you found the cheese this morning at breakfast, because that's a great device to measure the integrated flux of carbon that goes in and out of that landscape. If you could just drill a hole on top, put a device there, that would measure basically everything that's happening in terms of carbon emissions and sequestration in that landscape. Now, unfortunately, we're still working on the dome. We haven't quite finished it. Okay. It's not big enough to fit over our landscapes. But we have that approach now that we're rolling out, and that accomplishes just the same. So let me tell you the three main features of that approach. And it, in fact, yesterday I learned that it quite nicely aligns with what Andrew Steert discussed up here on stage with the idea that you have to count it, then change it, and then scale it up. The first idea and the first feature of that approach that I'd like to highlight has to do with landscape monitoring. We have to, and we are helping countries with technical assistance and resources to help monitor the landscapes in the way that they can keep track of the carbon in that landscape. And of course, nowadays, we have all sorts of fancy tools and technologies available to do that. Satellite remote sensing, drones, digital mapping. All these things are there in some shape or form in these countries, and we help put systems in place to do that more effectively. Oftentimes, what countries have is a forest monitoring system or national forest inventory, but that does not cover the entire landscape. So the countries need more, and we help them with that. The second feature is that that you can bring in more and more elements of that landscape over time as capacity is increased and as data is being gathered about that landscape and the carbon in that landscape. So maybe you start monitoring the forest first. That's one of the, the first things countries often do. And then later, when you implement and um, change your landscape through other interventions, for instance, changing livestock production or grasslands, then you can bring in these, these categories of carbon and carbon sources as well. And you start them making part, be part of that sink, that sponge, that carbon, uh, carbon sponge that you need to generate in that landscape. So scaling it and changing it over time is another important feature of our carbon accounting approach and that framework that we have now. And the third feature that I'd like to highlight is scale and scaling up. As I said earlier, many of our Countries work at the level of jurisdiction, states, provinces, large areas of their country. But I also showed you the challenge that we're up against. We have to make a true dent into global emissions, and landscapes are a third of the solution, basically. And that means you have to go from a jurisdiction to the entire country. And you have to take the finance that we have and pump that back into these landscapes. And the finance that we have, and we're quite generally endowed with a lot of resources to that effect, flows on the basis of the effective implementation of carbon-reducing activities. So as these activities start finding traction in the landscape and they bring carbon down, finance continues to flow into the landscape to further scale up. So that's the idea. You have to think big and go to scale. Now, if you are still thinking, of sitting in the sun in a warm place, let me remind you, the planet is in peril. You know that. But you also know that there's many great ideas out there to make landscapes an integral part of the solution, to bring global emissions down. Many of these ideas are discussed at the Global Landscapes uh, Forum. Now, just to give you a very quick teaser about the approach that we have developed and are rolling out next year, basically, to help countries develop programs at the scale 
that has potential to make a true contribution towards uh, solving this global challenge. Now, some of you may have recognized this as the cover of an LP from the 80s. That's the kind of stuff, you know, pubes and German boys would listen to at that uh, time. Now, if you have no idea what an LP is, I'm very encouraged, because that means you probably still have the majority of your professional career ahead of you to help us figure out making a change in these landscapes and help solve this problem. And that probably also means that you're still probably going to be around by the middle or the end of the century to find out whether we succeeded. So let me ask then, what are you thinking about? Thank you. <laughs>